In this video we're going to be talking about installation and configuration of peripheral devices. The typical steps to installing a peripheral device, the first step would be to power off the PC and remove the main power cord. It's very important that whenever you're removing something that the power of the PC should be off or whenever you're installing something. The second is the ESD precautions which is the electrostatic discharge precautions which we talked about earlier that we want to make sure that we are properly grounded or that we are using the proper precautions that we don't have electrical shock on the components. We would remove the system case cover and then we would go on to find the expansion slot. Sometimes the slot has a blank plate so we'd remove the blank plate from the slot at the back of the system case and then we would go ahead and insult, install the PC card pressing firmly, pressing it firmly into place and then screwing the screw back into the slot there. We replace the case, we then go ahead and we connect the external uh, cables including the main power cord, we power it on then we watch as um, we check the BIOS or if it's plug and play depending on the device that we've installed and we just make sure that it is configuring itself properly. We have to install the driver once the system is operating. With um, We can do this by selecting the add remove hardware unless you've got an operating system that automatically detects it then you'll be given a choice to install it. After that we should just to make sure that everything is working properly we want to check that there are no conflicts with uh, the IRQs in the device manager or with any other devices that are in the system and then simply we just want to test the device one time just to make sure that it is working properly by running the device as you normally would in a normal work environment. One kind of peripheral device that we might be installing might be a modem. So we see here just this is a typical modem that um, as we talked about earlier that we would take out the plate and we would install this in its place slip this uh, golden part into the slot and then we would simply insert the screw to attach the modem and then we would, could turn the system back on and we could see that the modem gets detected. So a few things about uh, modems they come in different speeds there's 288 kilobytes per second there's 56 kilobytes per second and generally that's considered the maximum that it is able to transmit. There are three different kinds of modems. We've got internal modems, external modems and PCMCIA modems. And an internal modem would um, be this that we see here. External modem would generally be a separate device or a box that you would be connecting to your computer and you would uh, attach the telephone wires to that particular box or device. And the PCMCIA modem would be more used for a laptop where you would slip, simply slip it into the appropriate slot and that would be the inserting of the modem card. And what a modem does, it converts a digital signal into audible analog tones to send the data and then once the data is receives, received it reconverts the analog signal into a digital signal that um, the computer can understand. So it modulates and demodulates hence the name modem. It's done with uh, asynchronous transmission which is a serial transmission. We've got here um, some different commands that are used with uh, the modem. You can see them better here in this. This is the modem strings and it initiates the modem. They're also sometimes known as AT commands because they're all going to begin with uh, letters AT. And what AT does is it basically tells the modem a command is coming. So by entering AT DT it means that the modem will then be using um, touch tone to, to do the dialing process. ATDP enters in and that means it would be using a pulse tone.
for the dialing process. ATA just tells the modem to simply pick up the, the telephone line. ATHX tells the modem to hang up. Depending on the amount of seconds that we can specify, we can specify anywhere from 0 to 10 seconds. AT and F resets the dialing to the factory defaults. ATZ resets the defaults to when it was last powered up. And star 67 disables call waiting. So these are just a few commands to keep in mind. We've got them in a shorter format here where A answers D to dial, DT to dial for the dial tones, the H to hang up, the Z is, as we said, saw earlier, that ATZ would reset it, and the backslash just simply repeats the last command. Talk a little bit about duplexing, and what duplexing is, it's um, the communication, the direction of communication. When you have a half duplex system, We've got a two-way communication, but we're only able to communicate at one direction at a time. This is analogous to maybe a walkie-talkie, where you're able to send information, and then you have to wait to receive the information, meaning that uh, both people can't talk at the same time. A full duplex, this should be a D in front of here, but a full duplex is a two-way simultaneous communication, which is like a telephone conversation where both signals are transmitted at the same time so one person can be speaking and another person can interrupt and they can both hear the other person talking while they are interrupting and a simplex is just simply a one-way communication We've also got listed here some ways that the modem does some error checking to make sure that the information that it's receiving is correct. The first one is the parity check. And what that does is it adds one parity bit to each piece of data. And in that way it's able to check if there's an error. Checksum, which is a little bit more efficient at checking errors, sends the value as the last two bits. So a few different kinds of storage devices that we're looking at here. We've got some hard drives, floppy drives, and CD-ROM drives. You can see here CD-ROM drive, typical hard drive, and a typical floppy drive. We're going to first be talking about the hard drive and the way that it's made up and some definitions about the hard drive. What it's made up of a series of platters, which can be glass or metal, and usually have two usable sides, which are marked with tracks. We can see here on our example that a track is just a simple cylindrical area that travels around the disk, and you would have a series of tracks where the information would be stored. What the whole disk itself is called, it's referred to as a platter. And this platter, as we can see here in our real life example, that it would revolve around a simple spindle. And there's a arm which is similar to a record player that um, would read and write the heads. It's got similar, something similar to a needle of a record player that it's able to read information. So as the information is requested it would spin the cylinder and the the arm here would be able to read the information and transmit it back into the system where we've got some RAM inside of this hard drive case that's able to take that information and process it and send it over to the motherboard. When we look at uh, the simple pl platter here, we've got tracks, and each track is divided uh, further into sectors, which would make up about 112K. And when we stack a whole bunch of platters together, that's what we refer to as a cylinder. 
So here we've got a stack of platters and we refer to it as one cylinder. Now hard drives range in their capacity to store information usually measured in gigabytes and they also they have their spinning speed which is the rate that the platters or the cylinder is able to rotate on the spindle and that rate can range anywhere usually around 7200 RPMs rotations per minute. Next we're going to look at floppy drives and these are your typical three and a half inch floppy drive. Before that we used to have computer systems which are pretty much phased out now that used to use a five and a quarter inch disc which is a little bit bigger. A typical floppy drive is able to hold information. A typical three and a half inch floppy can hold either seven, 720 kilobytes, 100 uh, 1.44 megabytes or 2.88 megabytes. The disks should be formatted by the operating state system in order to establish a logical data structure. We also have very similar devices which were used for zip drives and they also have very similar disks in themselves and they're like a high capacity floppy disk and they can range in being able to store data anywhere from 100 to 250 megabytes. Next we're going to talk about CD-ROMs. Typically your typical CD-ROM can hold anywhere between 650 megabytes to 700 megabytes per disk. And the technology that's used to read information is with pits and lands. The pits are indentations and the lands are what's between and this represents ones and zeros on your CD-ROM. Within the CD-ROM category we've got CDs which are recordable CDs also known as CD-Rs and these you get as blank CDs and you're able to place them in a CD burner which simply can burn information onto the disk and then once that's done you're only able to do that one time and you can read that information as many times as you like from the disk and it works with a simple chemical and metal layer which is a thin la layer and when you're burning the CD it actually removes part of the reflective parts which simulates the pits and the lens representing the ones and the zeros Next we've got the CD-RW which is a rewritable and what this does is it's um, these CDs are covered with uh, phase change material which crystallizes on write and rewrite and this is done through a heating and cooling process. Next we've got the DV DVD-ROMs and the DVD rewritable ROMs and what this is, this is um, much larger capacity can range anywhere from 4.7 to 18 gigabytes of information per disk. Much more condensed technology. We also see here a picture of the different connectors and the flat ribbon that would be connecting the particular storage device to the motherboard. So we see here that we would connect this part of the cable into the rear of the storage device which looks like the connector we have here and then we would simply place it onto the motherboard also in turn connecting the storage device onto the motherboard. Now the connectors are the same for both CD drives and also for hard drives and they're a little bit different for your floppy drive they'd be a little bit smaller 